Another Sunday, another case of the scaries to start your work week. Welcome to the newest edition of the Sunday Scaries, where we have all your gore, lore, and more. Covering all the latest horror happenings, slicing open all the latest horror news, and dissecting it bit by bit, finding all those juicy innards. Pour that cup of coffee and turn into Fright Lights while we take you on a tour of terror. And we are, yes, we are back in full effect here. Tons of content hitting the channel, lots of things to see, and a lot of things coming up. Dylan, you got to check out uh, The Meg 2, which I was mm -hmm. not able to make that viewing. Um, I have not watched the review yet, but you look none too pleased on the uh, thumbnail. So It's, uh, to be honest, a little bit of clickbait there. Um, it's not necessarily that I'm none too pleased. Uh, I do go into it into my review, but just the general like consensus of the Thursday night preview with the 0% on Rotten Tomatoes with only six critics and everybody kind of making a whole like big stink about it and everything, you know, I, I kind of dive into that a little bit, no pun intended, um, it, at a certain section of my review where I just kind of discuss, I don't necessarily know what the, the people were expecting when it comes to this film. I don't get why people thought that, you know, this was going to be like anything more than just your average, like, you know, Jason Statham is fighting a big shark. Now there's multiple big sharks yeah. on screen at the same time. Uh, Cause spoilers, if you saw the Meg, there are two Megalodons in that uh, one. That's a little bit bigger, but um, you know, I, I thought it was a fun movie. I, I said it in my review that I think for someone like me, who is a creature feature fan who has seen, the low rate bottom of the barrel garbage, everything from sci-fi channel to Tubi, uh, when it comes to these movies, I just went into this and the first film expecting, you know, basically that, but with a bigger budget and better looking CGI effects. And, you know, you get that it's a little bit higher quality than those, but at the end of the day, you got to look at the framework we're working with. It's a giant prehistoric shark coming out of a like trench in the ocean with a bunch of other prehistoric creatures and you know, it's they're they're attacking people. We're here for the spectacle. And you know, with that being said, I enjoyed it. Um, the other point that I kind of hit on in my review, which I, I do suggest you watch, I put a lot of effort into the, the edit of that. Um, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, but uh, it's one of those things where I did voice some concerns about the uh, franchise going forward. Uh, just because I think that if they really wanted to make this something special, this was the movie they needed to kind of really draw general audiences in. They played it really safe with the first one. And this one, I feel like they're still playing it pretty safe. And I think that it doesn't do anything too different. Uh, the third act is a blast. But other than that, it's pretty paint by numbers. It's pretty standard shit. Uh, there's some human bad guys. They're pretty boring. They, they don't do anything, which is to be expected. But I think the intent of this franchise, when the first one made half a billion dollars, they were like, this could be our next Jurassic Park. You know, we could have one of these that comes out every few years, uh, have more prehistoric creatures, more everything. And I think that they just have played it way too safe. They haven't done anything that's too exciting it's it's all like just again expected stuff it's like there's three megalodons and they don't do anything different than the uh the the previous film with the megalodons the only thing that's different comes from the other critters and you know it's funny the cast is enjoyable but uh you know it's just it's pretty paint by numbers yeah and you know going into that um I do think I will check it out. I don't know how fast this one's going to end up going to streaming. It just seems like they're in the theater for a month, maybe, and then they end up on some streaming service. So I don't know if I'll be able to make time to get to the theater to see before it is, uh, you know, out and on a streaming service. But it was something where, you know, it looked intriguing from the trailer. It did pique my interest um, to a certain level. And all I'm really looking for is an adequate sequel to that original because it's not mm -hmm. it's you know for me i guess i never really necessarily looked at it as a uh franchise that could be you know is someone a studio could look at it as like a jurassic park or kind of put it in a pedestal like that where it's become such a big pop culture franchise 
Whereas the Meg was just kind of, I remember going into the theater to see it originally and it was just like, ah, it was a fun movie, you know? It's, and then... That's the whole thing. That is exactly what I think everybody thought it was. I, I said it in my review that I think it was one of those things where the studios didn't understand that a lot of what um, drove this. And this is kind of like before uh, the like post COVID we've done this a lot with a lot of these movies, like, Mario was one that, you know, you had two camps. You had people that were excited for it and you had people that were going to go check it out because it was such an internet like trend. And it was one of those things where people were going crazy about it. Same with Barbie and Oppenheimer, that whole Barbenheimer thing, two big films that were bolstered to be even bigger because of all the internet trend. Meg was kind of like that in, an, in its infancy where everybody was like, Oh, a giant shark movie with Jason Statham. Yeah. But like that's lightning in a bottle. I they 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 can't just show up with the basics again, uh, you know, four years later and expect uh, massive returns. Like I said, you need to, to do something special. And I think that's the issue here. Uh, all in all, it's yeah. like it's it's it. Don't get me wrong. Your expectations right there are perfect. Like you're going to have fun. You're going to you're going to probably sit down and say that was a breeze. That was goofy. That was that was a good time. Uh, you know, I wish it was a little more gory, but there's definitely um, some vision there. But it's it's nothing more than that. You know, it, it's not it's it's not doing what a film needs to do in order to call itself a franchise. It's 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 just it's like kind of like Meg 2.0 in a sense. Yeah. Um. You know, and like looking at it, uh, I think there's probably going to be, a, you know, like you said, a lot of fun in the theater for that one. Um. Yeah. I'm curious to see what route they're going to take. I know we're <laughs> you've already seen it, so you already know. Uh, but, you know, I'm still in intrigued by this one. Uh, like you said, um, I'm guessing my my expectations are right in line with what I'm mm -hmm. going to see. Um, you know, the first one didn't disappoint me. Uh, this one did not look disappointing in any sense. So I'm still intrigued. Um, I think this, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'll lose something if I don't go to the theater to see this one because it seems like, you know, being able to see the Meg originally in the theater, I was able to, you know, just visually sit there with everything. Whereas I've turned on the Meg a few times and um, it's always one of those passive watches where I put it on and um, I never really sit down in 100 percent watch. it. It's like I come in in and out. Um, so I don't know if that'll affect just being able to see it on the TV rather than the screen, just because it is kind of a spectacle. It's same thing with like Kong. In Godzilla, where, you know, that was such a big event uh, when that had, what, post-COVID came out. And that was such a big thing or everyone getting back into the theater. Um, and that one I've turned on since. But, uh, you know, I don't know necessarily that I've had that same feeling that I had when I went to the theater to see it. Yeah, and I, I think for your first watch, you'll be able to sit through it and enjoy it. But again, I think it's just passive. It'll it'll turn into one of those. Um, it's not offensive. It's a, it's a fun popcorn film. It's good to just throw on on like, a, you know, a summer day, like summer evening. You're just looking for something to throw on while like you're, you know, just doing some work, maybe, you know, cleaning up some things. Because, you know, it's like for every uh, like cool action scene there is with the sharks, it's like there's, you know, a few minutes of just kind of pointless meandering in between that. And again, it's just kind of like I, I think that it's you're you're you've already seen the gimmick once. Uh, they say it in the trailer that it's uh, the they're like that's the the apex predator Meg, and that has nothing to do with the movie. Like that Meg is, is as standard as all the other ones from the like the first film and uh, comparatively to all the others, it does nothing special. It just is another megalodon, and that's the thing that sucks. Is it's just like again, it's Meg 2.0, um, so it doesn't move very much. Uh, again, it's goofy. It has a lot of great moments. There is a a fucking direct call out for Jaws 2. And I geeked. I said it out loud in the theater. Uh, I was so happy. I pointed out in my review. Uh, so it, it easily gets a five out of five for me. But, uh, you know, it's it's just one of those things where it's like, if you are a shark film fan, it's going to please you. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's it's it didn't hit that nerve that I think the studios were hoping for. Yeah. And I do not. It won't surprise me if, like, it does well this weekend, but just like marginally well. And then uh, after that, it just tapers off and goes to streaming in like a couple weeks. Cause yeah, that's it. It's just, it's nothing that I can sit at, come out of the theater. Like I did with talk to me and be like, you know, 
go see this movie. Like everybody I see, I who loves horror, I tell them to go see Talk to Me. Um, Meg, I'm I'm not gonna be doing that. You know, like yeah. even with my creature feature uh, friends who love that shit, I'm just gonna say if you want to go for it, but it's it's not anything different. Yeah, and so. you know, like you said, I'm sure inevitably we'll see a Meg three out there at some point. I hope, uh, but I don't know. You it know, depends. oh, I with everything turning to a franchise, whether Jason Statham's <sighs> attached or not, I feel like we'll probably get one just because why not at this point? It is. I think it will solely depend on the budget. Because if yeah. they spent way too much money on this and it doesn't make money, uh, they're just going to shit can it. I'm telling you, because like there's no way I, I think they're just being too aggressive these days, especially because we're put mid strike. It's like, you know, yeah. I think that it's I, it might I mean, die. it could probably take another four years. Um, But uh, with, uh, you know, everything that's going on uh, as we are mid strike and everything, uh, who knows what the future is going to look like in terms of um sequels original properties anything like that but you know i could easily see the make uh making a return especially if uh statham's uh career is on a down slope be like hey, <laughs> let's do a make three if they want to do it i'm i'm all here for it. you know i'll be there and i i have said this uh if you look into uh what the books because again these are very loosely based on the books yeah uh they kind of like take the title and like the bare basics and then do what the hell they want with it uh i think the third one if i'm not mistaken is called Hell's Aquarium. So it's kind of like they start uh, putting these Megs and other creatures into like a giant Jurassic Park like aquarium. And I'm like, that sounds so fucking fun. I'm so I so want that because again, that third act is great. Like the third act is is fun uh, for a one time viewing. I think it's going to be awesome to see. But yeah, it's like at once you've seen it, there's nothing to it really. Like it's just like okay, we we've done it. Well, That's you know it. we got. At the full review on on the uh, channel, so make sure you check that out. But why don't we hop into some some news as we're talking about franchises and uh, sequels? I think we have a couple to discuss here. That sounds like week. a great idea. Since considering we had our little talk about let's let's pull it back a little bit on the Sunday scaries, and we've already gone twelve minutes into another twelve minutes of my review of the Meg uh, two there. But hey, you know. I didn't get to talk to Luke about this one yet. We've been busy boys and we got kiddos fresh. and all kinds of shit. So we had to, we had to touch base. So uh, yes. Yeah, so why don't we kick things off with the first story, uh, diving back into another update for the final destination franchise. Yes. Uh, yeah. We've kind of touched on this. I think just about every time a little piece gets dropped, this is one of our uh, returning stories, but yeah, so they're just, again, nothing too solid, nothing too crazy, uh, but they are uh, teasing some uh, interesting ideas and kind of taking a, uh, a a different path for uh, this franchise going forward. And Luke, I know you kind of uh, looked into this a little deeper than I did. Um, tell me about your thoughts and feelings on what they're saying about Final Destination 6 here. Well, uh, you know, in this little article here, that uh, Jeffrey Reddick talks about how, you know, we're not going to follow that exact formula that we're used to uh, with the Final Destination franchise. Um, it, they're going to kind of play with what has been established to kind of bring something a little bit more fresh. Now, they didn't really go into any details. He did say, um, again, as we already mentioned, we're mid-writer strike here. Um, so this is kind of putting a pause on this. But he said, you know, once that's all... Whenever that gets settled, uh, this will be back up and running, and then they'll kind of more so have a release date, which I, from what I have seen, hopefully early to mid-2024 uh, is in theory what we were looking at, but who knows how long the strike's going to go. Um, but uh, Jeffrey Reddick did say, you know, it's well worth the wait, um, what he had read and everything. And John Watts, as we've talked about, it was kind of creating the story, um, he said he did come up with something really original. And I think that's what we need here as we, we've talked about so many different franchise horror sequels here and uh, where they don't divert enough to warrant, you know, this is like another stellar entry nowadays. Um, whereas it looks like Final Destination 6 is going to be taking that jump, at least from what we're getting right now is that we're looking for either a different formula or a different dynamic added here. Um, again, they speak very vaguely, but it's something where at least I think the Final Destination franchise has a good um, vision for where they're going to go and realize they need to bring something different instead of just, you know, 
rehashing that big event at the very beginning and then kind of giving us the same thing that we have seen, which we do see a lot with horror sequels. Yeah, I this is a franchise. I think I probably just to keep myself in check here and not go on a full tangent um, is something that, you know, I, I grew up watching these like I, I've seen them all. Um, and, you know, it's it's one of those franchises that, uh, you know, I I saw the first one, I think, on TV. I think one of the AMC Fright Fest the, for the very first time. Um, and then I never went back to it. I, I saw the sequels a lot more. And then a couple years ago, I want to say this was like just post pandemic, maybe the October of the pandemic. Um, I was going through your voodoo and I randomly threw it on the very first one. And I, I was just so blown away by just how fresh that film felt, especially yeah. compared to just after seeing all these sequels and, you know, just seeing the repetitive nature of them and just kind of where they go and just how that first one had so much care and 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 love to it and i mean devin sawa is fucking great in that movie like it is such a little time capsule of a film and uh yeah i i genuinely uh, it, like at that moment had mad respect for uh that very first film and could see why uh this spun off at the time into five sequels yeah and looking at that original film and i still go back to it uh, repeatedly nowadays and i'll mm -hmm. say I, I feel like that original film has notably a more dark tone to it as opposed oh, absolutely. to the other one. Where it's like, as we get to the second one, which I love the second one, but oh yeah, there one, two, and three are two and three are fun. They yeah. they are very fun. After that, I'll take it or leave it. But you know, it's like I feel like once we hit two, you can really tell it's more commercial. Where it's like, okay, we're trying to make a franchise out of this film. With that first film, it just seemed like an entry, and I think that's maybe that's the same also with like Saw, where it's like. Oh, yeah. um, th those first entries just feel darker. They feel more original. They feel like its own film as opposed to the entries that had come after it. And, um, you know, looking at Final Destination as a whole, I think they have pretty strong entries for the most part, even though they do fall in that basic formula, um, especially the last entry, you know, um, in terms of, you know, the storytelling that they were doing. Um, they always try to bring something different. So now looking at Final Destination 6 and knowing, hey, we really want to take a different route here and we were really going out of our way to bring something different to the table really does get me pumped for this one as we've talked about you know saw x where that one i didn't feel is original enough i feel like maybe it's a little bit past in terms of that hook um and then the exorcist believer where they're you know I, that one's a big question mark where we're not really pumped for it i think final destination destination six for me is something where it's an established horror franchise it is something i'm looking forward to because a lot of the information coming out here does seem like they are making an effort to give us something new yeah and i don't remember so is john watts is he he was just writing he's not slated he's a, to direct or he's no not he's not directing it it's the duo that did freaks which i haven't seen uh john watts is not even um i don't think he wrote the screenplay either he didn't pin the screenplay he wrote a story He's oh, like wow. getting the so story just... credit for it and he's producing. Okay. So he's attached to it in that fashion. Um, so I think he's uh, being credited for originally bringing that this new idea. And then, um, you know, whoever the writing duo, I think it is a duo um, had come out and is kind of expanding upon. And I think the the duo that did Freaks is, is directing, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, I'm checking into it right now, um, because like I think having someone like that who you know, has, again, he's kind of been stuck in the MCU. I get stuck. He's made uh, three really great Spider-Man movies. Um, but, uh, you know, and I say, just don't rip me apart. Really great. Not the end all be all. I love Raimi. Don't worry, guys. Um, for some reason, people get up in arms when you start comparing Spider-Man movies online. I I'm just getting frustrated with people. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I like John Watts. If you haven't seen Cop Car... Um, I know oh Luke and I are pretty big on that film. That was, I, I still think not enough people have seen that movie. No, I, I own it on Blu-ray. It's one that I, I go back to every once in a while and just think, why don't I watch this more? Kevin Bacon. So fucking good in that movie, dude. Like he's it's, so it's on another, another creepy, level. dude. Yeah. It's, it's really solid. Um, definitely, uh, worth a watch. And it, you know, you have a creative like that, um, you know, at least giving some kind of an input, as long as it doesn't get lost in the sauce, I think that you could have a, a chance 
for this to really get back to the the roots and the feeling of that first film like you said be a little bit darker um be a little bit more and i don't it doesn't have to be too original it just has to be you know it just has to strike that tone and you just have to have yeah. good characters because that's the thing it, it might be an all-star cast uh by today's standards for the most part in the first final destination it's not all-star but i mean you have the likes of devin sawa and sean william scott and others in there so it's kind of like you know you see those recognizable faces but they're still good characters they're not deep by any means but for horror characters they're still very fun and relatable and they they're they take themselves just seriously enough um to carry the film as opposed to you get to these other films and it's just like you don't know who the hell anybody is i remember uh mary elizabeth winstead that's the only other per- but she's a great actress and she's great in everything that she's in so it's like in the third one and then that's it i don't know anybody else and it just turns into this thing where it's just like i'm just here to watch you guys die and that's it yeah so. and, and that's where it's like you know that first film and i think maybe to an extent the second one but character wise in that second one with that ali larder's really the only notable character i think because mm-hmm. in, in she's one. a returning, returning character isn't yeah she? And um, beyond that, it's like it sitting around. I think everyone, especially who's a horror fan, has struggled to remember what kill is in what entry and what character is in what entry because they're so service level. Whereas that first film, I think, is so notable um, where you can kind of really pick out each nook and cranny in that one because it is, is well th- thought out. And again, it feels like one of its own, you know, one in its own in that whole franchise itself. Yeah, especially four and five gets so interchangeable. Yeah. Once you get there, like I, I, I think that even our last time talking about this, I was getting kills mixed up. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely uh, something I'm looking forward to. I hope that they resolve the uh, strike. They pay uh, the writers and actors and and get them the deal that they deserve. And so that way, hopefully, we can get this in 2024. But uh, why don't we move on to the next uh, little story here, a little tidbit, uh, talking about a film that we just mentioned in the opening. Um, not the Meg 2, but Talk To Me. Uh, yes, the, uh, the the voices, the brothers behind Talk To Me, um, were uh, discussing the fact that uh, they have already shot an entire prequel based on the film's opening sequence. Now, that's a tad misleading. Uh, Mr. John Squires, that that got me very, very excited. I don't think he watches the show, but if he does, hey, we love your work. Just talking some shit. But uh, as you read the article, uh, they do get into the fact that, uh, yes, the Racker Racker brothers have uh, shot a, a sequel that is focused entirely on uh, the character of Duckett. Um, and so it's one of those things where this is not a full film. This isn't a Ty West Pearl situation, unfortunately. I saw Luke sent me that article and I read through it on my lunch break and I was just like, well, it's not what I was hoping for, but it's still pretty cool. And uh, it looks like it's kind of like a short film. They don't necessarily mention how long it is. Uh, It could be 10 minutes, could be a half hour, uh, but it does seem like something that uh, is going to maybe be a companion piece uh, released later, uh, potentially on Blu-ray uh, potentially some other exclusive way, maybe a 24 will do some kind of like of a fan screening where you see, talk to me and then you'll see this afterwards or before or something. That'd be kind of cool. Um, but you know, other than that, it's, 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 that's, that's really about it. They kind of discuss some of the ideas into it. They talk a little bit more about the mythology and they do hint the fact that they are talking about, uh, they have other original properties that they'd like to bring to the screen. Also horror, but um, they also have ideas and things they've already written for a potential sequel. So we're kind of talking about a potential talk to me universe here, Luke. And how do you feel about it? Uh, well, you know, for me, like if you haven't checked out a review, we urge you to, if you haven't seen the film, we urge you even more to um, uh, this film is such an enigma right now, um, especially after leaving the theater and the uh, week after i'd say you know lives in your head uh as you're just thinking about especially (laughs) at night when the lights are off um you know looking at this originally when i saw that headline you know i got a little hesitant and then i think my interest peaked a little bit more realizing that it's more of a short and they had mentioned that this is you know i think what through social media mostly and through Mm -hmm. uh, phones in terms of you know i think that's a unique 
side of storytelling. Um, and especially fits right in line with talk to me. Uh, but like looking at it, I don't know. I wouldn't have wanted a full prequel. I, I think the beauty in this film, again, we talk about, uh, where they kind of dive into the mythology of this hand and everything. And, you know, it's, it's a very short explanation and not even a full explanation or a hundred percent accurate. It's just kind of thrown by the wayside, which feels really realistic to me rather than this kind of deep dive of, Oh, this is it. Let's do some flashbacks. Let's take you out of the moment. Um, which it doesn't seem genuine to me. So like to dive more into that instance, I think maybe would take away, um, from that opening scene is so effective in us not really knowing too much, putting context to that too much, I think uh, would take away a lot for me. And even diving into a sequel here where it's like, you know, having these voices behind it, I think we could have a fun sequel, but I don't want to dive too deep into the realm of what makes talk to me, you know, what facilitates the events that are, you know, what we're seeing on screen. It's like, I don't think we need that. Um, I think, you know, sometimes I go back to handholding and we need to over explain every little thing. And that's kind of my, where I get hesitant with sequels. It's like, if we want to put a new intriguing instance and we as an audience who has seen the original already know, you know, the potential for the danger and what's going to happen. Hey, I'm all for that because I think, you know, uh, I think the entertainment values there, but if we're going to, uh, take a minute or, you know, take a full half hour and tell us every little thing about this hand and what made it happen. I would not be interested in that. And, you know, um, surprisingly that is, to I'm going to agree. I think that's totally fair. Um, there's, I go a little bit back and forth on this. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you. Um, I'm definitely curious to see what more they could do with this concept in this world. Um, but I, my heart of hearts tells me that I would like this to be a one and done. I, I think that it's perfect where it's at. And I don't necessarily, like you said, want to, uh, you know, open the door anymore. I think the magic of it is just how they, uh, you know, explained as much as they did and they left it on the table. It, it really, uh, sits in my mind in, in a very, uh, wonderful place it's a lot like um where skinnamarink or the outwater sits which is why i compare those three so much uh because i think that uh, all three of these films um even though um the outwaters has uh some compendium short films with it um but they they just add more to the characters and mm -hmm. to the and, and with that concept of it being found footage it, it's a little bit more to it. It, it there's a little bit more and robbie even mentioned um, in our interview that uh, at some point he'd like to release a commentary um, with like a detective uh, kind of going through it as if it was real footage. And, you know, that's all like fun stuff. Like that's all really good stuff that can build onto it. This film, I don't think necessarily needs it. I think the way that they're doing it through social media, it would be a fun featurette. Like I said, it would be fun to go to like a uh, re-release screening in like October for this where we get to go see it again and maybe they play it beforehand if it's like 10 minutes and you know you just get to go and experience the film again um you know that would be really cool but you're right i i think that it would be the best route to take with this in my opinion would be for them to uh go into more of their original properties and uh maybe just lay some hints that this could potentially be in the same universe you know yeah. like um you know because if this exists in that world, um, you know, who's to say that there is another creepy, weird, demonic shit out there um, that could do it. It doesn't have to directly tie into it or be the same thing or even the same entity or uh, even a ghost at all. It could be fucking werewolves if they want it to be. And, you know, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's the route I'd like to see them go with this. But I think it's cool. And again, it does um, kind of lean on. Uh, this aspect that I'm seeing with a lot of first time filmmakers who are really hungry is, uh, you know, something that uh, I think we felt to a certain degree. I know I can definitely speak for myself when I say this, that I, I have felt this a lot with our uh, recent completion of our short is that once you've got one in the can, your brain just goes and you just want to keep shooting, keep filming keep things going, keep making stuff, learning from your mistakes every single time and just keep crawling. 
Um, so it's like to see these guys didn't rest and they just were like, okay, now let's make a short. Let's dive into this. Uh, Robbie did those other shorts and then he went and made another, uh, you know, film. It's just one of those things where it's like, just keep the vibes moving. And I, I like to see that. I like to see how hungry these two are, uh, to be in this business. And, and again, I think they deserve all the praise that they've been getting. Talk to me is a wonderful film and I'm really excited to see what these guys do next, even if it's not in this universe. Absolutely. And that's where I think I'm more so intrigued of knowing that they have other properties out there that they, you know, want to push and, and get done. Uh, because again, talk to me, such an original film that's out there. And, you know, I can see a studio being like, oh, well, let's instantly get a sequel in the works here because we need to capitalize on, you know, this thing did do great at the box office considering what they were uh, projecting. So it's like, I could easily see this being like, oh, well, let's get a talk to me too out there. But, you know, knowing this original property that didn't exist until these two, you know, thought it out and then gave it to us, uh, you know, as a real treat on screen. I'm really intrigued to see them do something different. I don't mind them coming back to talk to me, but maybe after they get a few films down, just because I'm so intrigued to see what original voice they're going to bring to a different story. And, you know, when you come out with something like talk to me and, Again, you know, I Jordan Peele, I think, has made a lot of great films. He's added a lot to the horror community. But I think, like, a lot of people have become so inspired with we need to intertwine every little thing and every little thing needs to make things or mean things to, you know, whatever whatever the story is. Um, where I think, you know, that type, type of storytelling has become uh just the norm now and that was one of the big takeaways for talking to me where it was like we're not going to handhold you we're not going to um tell you too much about anything and i love living that space and i'm really curious if uh that's their voice that's what they're going to do they're not going to harp on every little detail so uh for this one i wouldn't mind a talk to me sequel uh but i would want it way down the line after these two of you know, had a chance to kind of tell different stories and and bring new, unique properties to the horror space, hopefully the horror space. Um, but, you know, I'm intrigued to see if we do get to see this prequel. I like the way the idea behind it, um, especially if it's just something real short, if it's a five or ten minute, whatever it could be. Um, and I don't think it's going to take anything away from the story at all. So I'm intrigued. Um, I'm um more than happy to see these two hopefully come out with something in the next couple of years. Um, because like you said, once you start in the space, in the creative space, your mind just goes and mm -hmm. you want to come up with a bunch of different things. And um, you're always looking for that next story. So I'm really curious to see what these two have up their sleeve. Yeah, I know just finishing uh, the shooting of sycophant, you know, we're still editing things, but uh, you know, every time I, you know, click off that file, and, uh, you know, just go to bed for the night. My mind just races on like, you know, ideas, especially waiting for our buddy Adrian to, uh, you know, finish cleaning up the uh, the dialogue and the audio because we had about a week break where we had to let him work his magic. Um, that whole week uh, it was just spent Luke and I just passing scripts, little short film scripts back and forth. And just like I think I wrote like three in the span of a week of just like concepts and was like you got to read this you got to read this you got to read this and you're just like dude i'm i'm fucking trying like i'm just i'm so busy <laughs> right now and it's just like yeah i know i'm just i'm i'm excited and i'm a i'm i'm a freak but uh i also just want to share this real quick before we move on to the next story uh my as i was talking i was multitasking and my brain uh had me think of something really cool cuz you know i'm always thinking about shit for my background i'm a very selfish person um but uh Look at that. Oh, there we go. And it's uh, 3D printed, 40 bucks. They'll send What's it to you. On? Etsy. Oh, Etsy. Yeah, I got yep. you. Etsy comes a little candle. Real cute That's shit. That's a nice addition. Yep. I'm great. just like, yeah, get that and then scribble all over it. Yeah. The whole thing. Be perfect. So, yeah, if you're a Talk To Me fan um, and you would like a hand, like I think we all would, uh, 40 bucks and uh, it can all be yours. I don't know how to pull up the seller's name or information but yeah i just typed in uh talk to me so talk to me uh hand oh there it is uh lewis benetes yes uh do it grab it make it yours but uh why don't we move on to some other big news here something speaking of sequels that uh i know i think luke is pretty damn excited for this yeah um i 
must admit, uh, you know, and actually I'll hold it. Why don't we announce this first and I'll let you talk and then I'll get into this. Uh, but scary stories to tell in the dark too. Andre Overdahl confirms the sequel is still in development. So yes, that's, that's great to hear um, for all you scary stories fans. Um, that's, that was something that uh, I know got a lot of positive reception when it came out. Um, and it was something that really resonated with you there, Luke. So why don't you uh, take the stage there and talk about it? Yeah, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was something that I did go to the theater to see. This was, um, I don't know if you read this in grade school at all. Um, I was a Goosebumps kid, honestly. I had always wanted to. Um, just never found the time. Okay, so yeah, well, It didn't resonate know, too hard with me. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was, you know, uh, more so volumes where um, Goosebumps... I mean, R.L. Stein's a madman where he was just coming out with there's so many different books out there. Hey, like we said, once you get started, you just keep moving. Yep. And uh, Scary Stories Tell uh, in the Dark was such a uh, weird thing. You know, it was almost an unattainable thing. It was something that was at the library at school and every kid wanted it. So, you know, you'd be like every kid, you know, a kid would have it for a week and then it'd be passed around. Um so something to really hard to get a hold of, but um, I know my had, my sister had gotten a hold of it one time, and we were able to kind of just you know peruse through it, and it was really something where um, it was so talked about and so built up that you know it always stayed with you as a kid. Uh, so when the film released, I was so excited to actually be able to go out and, and see this one, and you know I think it gets a comparison to something like a Stranger Things because Stranger Things was so popular at the time. Uh, but I think it does have its own voice, um, especially as um, writing something in the same similar time period at the time uh, was really, you know, nice to see on screen and how well visually, you know, it came to be. Um, so I was so excited when the sequel was announced. Now, I honestly, I never really looked up too deep um, for a long time. I just thought this thing was pretty much dead. Um, yeah, but, you know, seeing this pop up got me really excited, um, especially it looks like at least initially when this was discussed, the original team was coming back. I hope that's the case uh, because I think this one, again, a lot of fun in the theater the first time around. I can't wait to see it the second time. Yeah. Um, for me, I didn't catch this one in the theater. It was one that I was a little trepidatious of. I, I think um, ultimately where I'm going to sit with this, so I don't go into my whole diatribe of why I felt the way I felt. Um, it, it really comes down to, I think just being a bit stranger things, out at the time yeah. and this getting so many comparisons to it that when i did eventually sit down and watch it this was another one i believe that uh was uh graciously provided by you and your voodoo account mm -hmm. um so i uh i checked this out and i liked it um it didn't necessarily stick with me i think as deep um and it it, it again it could have been that it could have been the because I know this this was also getting a lot of comparisons to Andy Muschietti's It at the time. Yeah. And when did this first one come out? Was that the same year as Chapter 2? That I'm not entirely sure about. Because if it was, that could have really been a huge factor for me. Because I was very frustrated with It Chapter 2. Yeah. And honestly, I think that that also played a, a little bit of... Um, now I'm kind of having this come to Jesus moment with this where I'm like, maybe that was also why I kind of started to really fall off the stranger things wagon. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where I, I definitely respect it. I'm happy that people love it. And I think, um, this is one that I'm going to have to go back and, uh, give it another go because yeah. I do like the autopsy of Jane Doe. And I've been very, very vocal about how excited I am for Last Voyage of the Demeter. I think that looks amazing. Um, I'm really hoping that that delivers next week. But um, yeah, I, I think that this one may have just caught me at a bad time. So if the, the sequel does come out, um, you know, obviously we're going to go see it now. Like I'll, I'll accompany you and everybody to go see it. But I, uh, you know, I, I just got to be honest that I wasn't huge on it when it when I saw the first one. You know, and I think maybe that could be the case for a lot of people where it was just uh, the, the time period was such a factor for people because this definitely came out after Stranger Things was having its run and after the the initial it 
chapter one had come out. So I think those comparisons were going to be made, whether they warranted or not. I think this one does have its own voice, especially for that time period. And they don't, I mean, th there's some humor in it, but they don't lean into, you know, it chapter one has its own kind of, you know, uh, with Richie and everything like that, where I don't think this one necessarily has that. Um, again, I'm a huge fan of these kind of in, almost anthology tales and being able to to bring these characters that were out uh, of the books into real life and how they were able to do it and, you know, make it make sense uh, to an extent. Um, I, we have the pale lady here, which uh, for me was just uh, wild to actually see on screen with the red lighting and everything I think was really well done. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where I'm curious to see, especially will we have a palette cleanser where it's in a rear view. Um, Stranger Things is coming to an end. By the time this releases, I think maybe we'll be able to judge it more so it's on its own merit rather than, uh, you know, being accompanied by so many other uh, popular properties that have a similar tone to it. Yeah, I, uh, I did look it up and uh, this came out in... Um august on august 9th of 2019 and it chapter two uh came out september 6th so they are basically a like a month apart and again i did not see this yep uh Until in theaters later. so yeah i saw this when it uh, came out when you had gotten it on like 4k yeah so it's one of those things where it was probably like three four months down the road and yeah i i i could easily see a little bit of that stigma leaking over uh, just because it, it did feel very similar in tone. Another thing that I think bothered me a little bit um, was some of the CGI, I think, was a little rough in this, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think for me, too, the uh, this is also why I don't I didn't fall in love with Fear Street, um, too. So it's like that's one of the things I know a lot of people really love yeah. those movies. Um, I think that one was my scary stories tell in the dark more so. Mm -hmm. um fear street was just something that did not hit with me yeah but uh, like in like looking at this one <clears throat> i think i've seen the first goosebumps film uh but i actually scary... haven't seen either of those and and, I, i'd and, like to and like for me scary stories to tell in the dark was what i had wanted i guess from a goosebumps tale where it was like it has mm -hmm. a little bit of a darker tone it's not afraid to kind of push the envelope a little bit it doesn't fully do it uh, but to an certain to a certain extent, I think it does. Whereas Goosebumps just was kind of such a you know kid friendly thing, where without pushing it, where Scary Stories Tell in the Dark, the book, you know, there was a lot of pushback when this originally came out for kids. And, oh yeah, because it no, did push I, that envelope. A lot of people made videos about the uh, the kind of controversy that was surrounding this book when it was in schools and stuff, um, because they thought it was just too dark for children. Yeah. And that's where it's like for me, like this one, I didn't necessarily make that comparison to it because it is a rated R film where this is like a PG-13 mm -hmm. where it's like it, the art is in that teetering of making it for kids just enough and then also making it scary just enough for kids. And I think they did it well in that first installment. So, I mean, that second one, I'm hoping they they do, you know, if they have that original team back, um, I really hope they they knock this one out of the park for me as well. Yeah, I again, I'd love to talk to um, Andre Overdahl for, uh, you know, the last voyage of the Demeter, if we could get an interview with him. Um, and I would love to revisit this. I think I'm more in a better headspace now to do it, especially I, I'll, I'll hold off because we're only a week away. If that movie hits the way I'm hoping it does for me, um, I guarantee you by next week, I will sit down and rewatch scary stories just to give it an honest watch. Cause yeah. I do have to be real and think that there may have been some bias there just from, you know, what had been, what we had been inundated with and things like that. And that's, that's the beauty of, you know, films is you can go back and, you know, really tailor your opinion and decide, you know, how you feel about certain things. Um, you know, there are certain movies that uh, we even praised last year that, you know, I kind of sit back and think on and I'm just like, you know, Maybe I uh, may maybe that wasn't as good as I thought, or you know, maybe there's ones that I bashed a little too hard, and I'm like, yeah, maybe that's good. So that's the thing. I gotta I gotta reassess on this one, uh, and also because I don't really remember a lot about it. So yeah, you know, that's that's kind of where I sit with it. I think I was a little too passive in my viewing experience, but nonetheless, why don't we hop into our final story here, the big story of the week, the one everybody has been waiting for, the one I'm sure Luke is going to plaster all over the thumbnail. 
uh, just to catch everybody's attention. And that is, of course, the big news. And honestly, uh, the news I was hoping for, and we'll get into that a little bit. But uh, Scream 7 is going to be officially helmed by Christopher Landon. Yes, Radio Silence has stepped out. They are working on their Universal property, their um, Dracula's Daughter, I believe is what it's called right now. Um, you know, it could be changed. It's, it's very early development. Um, but uh, they're working on that. And the, uh, yeah, I'm going to open my window there. I could have done that the whole time. Um, and uh, yeah, Christopher Landon is in. Now, I'll say my piece on this real quick, and then I'll let Luke go, but I won't uh, talk too long. Because uh, I do have a lot to say on this. I, I had considered seeing if you wanted to do a standalone video on this. Um, we might still be able to, depending on how long we talk here. Um, but we just had a lot going on this week as far as content. Yeah. We had like three new reviews and some other shit in an interview that went up. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where this is exciting. Um, now, I have not seen Happy Death Day. I have not seen Happy Death Day to you, and I have not seen Freaky. But I hear that a lot of people really like them. I believe you've seen some of those, haven't you? I've seen Happy Death Day. Um, I've seen some of Freaky. It's one of those ones where I mean, to, I turn on and something always happens and I never get through it. Um, Happy Death Day to you, I have not seen. Um, they all have like certain comedic tones to it as well, mm -hmm. uh, mixing mm -hmm. with that horror. But they kind of, again, he. I think Christopher Lane is one of those guys that makes it make sense where it's like we have comedy but it fits the bill for the horror that is involved if that makes sense absolutely and um you know i think that uh i i trust mike from we watched the movie a lot i you know he's he's a big scream fan and he's been covering this like crazy so i've been watching all of his videos on this and um you know it's one of those things where i i you know, he's seen all these films and he's been talking about them and just kind of the, the approach to it. And I do need to sit down and watch them to really assess my opinion. But I, I like in general this switch because Radio Silence, although I really like um, uh, shit. Now I'm forgetting the name of the movie. Uh, the one with Samara Weaving. Um, oh, right ready or not. not. Yes. Although I enjoyed that movie a lot. Um we've been pretty open that they haven't really blown us away with their, uh, their additions to the scream franchise, uh, scream five. We're very critical on, we have a video with our buddy, Evan, where we all kind of sit down and talk about that for what, over an hour. And, uh, and then scream six, you know, we, we had a review there and a spoiler discussion about it. So, and I like scream, uh, six more than five, but even six by the end just really didn't hit it for me. And, uh, yeah, I, I've, been very kind of crossing my fingers in a lot of ways. I know a lot of people might hate this, but I've been crossing my fingers that they would have another filmmaker step in and uh, take another approach to it because I just don't think they're hitting it for me. So even though I, I'm not familiar with Christopher Landon's work too deeply, um, I, I get the tones. I've seen the trailers and I know what from people have said. Uh, I, I'm just genuinely excited to have some fresh blood in here. So that way we don't just get a trilogy like David Gordon Green, where it is just him one right after another, and we're just kind of dealing with it. Because, um, again, we could go into all of the Halloween shit and him, but like I just feel like the vision didn't work for me in 2018, and by ends, it was really not working, even though I did enjoy Kills. And I was kind of feeling like this was going to take the exact same trajectory where I thought six was a little better, but five didn't work. And God knows what seven was going to be. And in this one here for Scream 7. Now, is this Christopher Lane and stepping behind uh, the camera for a full fresh take here? Or is this him stepping behind the camera for a radio silence? Scream so seven that script? is um, what is from what I understand, what is still up in the air. Okay. Um, because of the strike, obviously, um, there isn't um, anybody really able to write. I believe that Radio Silence has ideas. There might even be a draft out there that from what people are saying. But uh, Christopher Landon has also written um, all of his projects. Yeah. So it would make sense to me that he would 
uh, have a pass at the script and I'm sure he's probably working on it, um, you know, on his own accord, maybe. I don't know how the, uh, the, the, uh, the rules are for the strike, if he can even do that, like if he can even do it on spec. Hey, I, from what I know, you're not even supposed to be writing. Damn, um, that sucks. Could you imagine just like having ideas and just not legally, like, you know, being able to just yeah. sit down and do it? Like that would hurt. That would suck. It sucks for everybody except yeah. the studios. Fuck them. But, um, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I, I, I would imagine that he would step into the writer's chair. And that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for a completely fresh take on this uh, installment here. Uh, just taking, you know, some bullet points. Um, some and characters. Maybe, and... Yeah, and just sitting down maybe with Radio Science and saying, what was your direction? Okay, I got it. Let me make, you know, maybe try to fit it as best that I can, but let me do my own thing here for most of the film. Um, is what I'm hoping for. I really don't want this to be a radio silent script with Christopher Lane and just, you know, stepping behind the camera. I think, you know, um, five and six didn't really do it for us. So I think we do need a fresh take here, especially to kind of, if we're closing this chapter for now, um, to really go out with a bang. Um, I, you know, for this one, uh, I don't know. It, it's very weird that we're having someone step in for the final, you know, this being a, in theory, a trilogy for Radio Silence, and now someone else coming in for the last installment, which is that big, you know, what we were working toward in theory, and now we're going to have a completely new person coming in. I'm not against it because I wasn't a huge fan of 5 and 6, uh, but I can see a lot of people, you know, not being happy about uh, some new blood coming in here for uh, the seventh installment here. Uh, but, you know, um, Happy Death Day for me, it was fine. It's not something that I regularly go back to and watch. Um, the other happy death day to you as well as freaky. I'm really going to have to sit down to really make a full assessment on this one. Uh, I, he, he's able to mix that comedy and horror, which, you know, scream does, uh, to an extent. Um, so if he is writing this, I, I think it could come out pretty decent. I know, um, people are really, um, critiquing him on that. We have a ghost. Um, I haven't seen it. I did not look really well done from, my perspective. Uh, but I think, again, that's a different tone than Scream. So just because that didn't look great doesn't mean that that's going to uh, bleed over into Scream 7. That film, from everything that I understand, and I haven't watched it, um, is very much gateway horror. It, it's, it yeah. is very uh, geared towards a younger audience. And, you know, I think that's fine. I, I, I wouldn't say, um, you know, lean on him for that entirely because i mean like look at robert rodriguez like the guys made from dust till dawn el mariachi desperado all those uh great early films and you know he, he's gone on to do things like the grindhouse planet terror which i adore um and yeah he's got some misses in there but he also made the spy kids movies so yeah. it's one of those things where it's like they, they he just had an idea he wanted to make it and you know everybody grows up watching films like that so if you have a story that's more, uh, you know, oriented towards a younger audience and you want to tell it like, go for it. Like, I don't, I don't see, I don't, I don't think there's any reason why anybody should, you know, like really put the smack down on anybody for that. Yeah. You know, and it, even if it wasn't the greatest film in the world, I, you know, that's fine. That's, you know, it is what it is, but I, I still think that this is exciting again because I'm excited to have some fresh blood here. Some people, have said that it sucks that radio silence isn't going to be able to see their trilogy all the way through. And, uh, you know, again, I'm citing uh, Mike from, we watched a movie here. Um, he kind of brought up a good point in the sense of, I don't think that this was ever, uh, geared as a trilogy. I, I think that it was always assumed, but I think that they've just kind of been approaching this, uh, as the films go. So like, you know, they, they had ideas for a sequel to five, they got to execute it because five did really well. And then, you know, they've had ideas for seven. But again, I'm also I, I want to reiterate, I'm not like a, a hater of Radio Silence. Again, I like their first film. Um, they just didn't work well for me in Scream. And, you know, that's fine. It, it wasn't like the worst thing in the world. It's just I, I was I, I like Scream to be a certain way. I want them to impress me. I, I want to get back to the 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 glory days of like our Scream One and Scream Four, and to some degree too. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, I, I I'm looking forward to their 
uh, endeavor into the Universal Monsters realm. I, I think that that's a great fit. It seems like they jumped on that really quick, and that seems like a, a big passion for them. And I want them to chase that. I I don't want them to feel uh, handcuffed to scream like they have to go through and be like, all right, well, we got to finish seven so we can go do this. Like, that's the last thing in the world I want anybody to do. And to have Christopher Landon come on here and then, you know, put out that tweet where he was just saying how thrilled he is to be on it, that he's a huge fan of the franchise. You know, whether that's true or not, I, I believe that it is. He seems very genuine. Um, I'm excited to see some fresh blood in here. I again, it we've heard a lot of things about David Gordon Green and team um, being very tired of Halloween by ends. And that's why it got such a shift. That's why they changed the script entirely. And, you know, it's one of those things where that is the last thing I want to see Scream do. So I'm, I'm just hoping that Christopher Landon comes in here. Um, I want a punchy third attempt here, especially if this is kind of going to be like the trilogy wrap up for our characters from, you know, five and six, even if it's not, that's fine. But I want a little more punch. I enjoyed the punch that we got with six for the most part. Six just didn't work for me in the reveal and the wrap up. It got too formulaic. So if they can kind of balance that with that punch from six, but, you know, offer us a little something more with some stakes and a little something different that we don't see coming or just put fucking stew in the movie. I'm there. I'm happy. I'm good. Yeah, I'm intrigued to see what they're going to bring here. Um, you know, I, I think Radio Silence, uh, they had two attempts, didn't really hit. Uh, but uh, having some a new voice here, hopefully a new script um, coming in and, and kind of making this kind of, I, I would guess, would be the ending or closing chapter of uh, some of the characters that we've uh, been seeing regularly for the past two installments. Um, I just hope we do get that closure. I and mean, this isn't a Halloween end scenario where it's like, you know, we kind of forget a lot of things we've been working toward. Uh, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. I'm definitely intrigued. I don't think this is an indictment on Scream 7 at all. I think, if anything, it piques my interest a little bit more uh, than having radio silence attached. But I guess we're going to have to wait and see. That is true, my friend. That is true. I, I am, again, looking forward to this. I think that this is all positive. But, uh, you know, at the same time, who knows? We're just going to have to wait and see. It, it might be. It's nice that he's here. Um, again, writer strike, actor strike. We don't know when this is coming out. These films seem to have a quick turnaround. So we could be looking at Scream 7 by 2025 is my best guess. I don't think I feel like 2024, unless it's really late, would be way too optimistic. But uh, yeah, maybe in early 2025 and uh, yeah, we'll sit down. We'll take a look. We'll see. Maybe we can get Sydney back. That'd be cool if we need her. I don't know. Maybe we'll actually kill some fucking characters. I don't know. Like that's uh, that would be great, too. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm more optimistic than negative on this, I must say. Time will and, tell. And that, that's a good sign for us because we are really harsh on franchise horror. So that that's kind of our, our wheelhouse there. But yeah, that's uh, that is the news for this week, folks. And uh, Luke, we we failed again. Uh, we, we have done an hour show. And, uh, you know, we, we do want to wind this back a bit and uh, we're going to get there. But I feel like my exhaustion from just how busy my day has been and just how busy this week has been for both of us Uh just led me to ramble and i apologize for that but i think we'll nonetheless there. it was also the fact that we had four really cool stories four really good good stories this week compared to last week these are four awesome stories because i felt like last week other than the NECA stuff was pretty weak but um you know we do our best for you guys so we we try to find the good stuff luke is is really great he's our content genius over here of selecting what we discuss so you know i like talking about horror who knew? <laughs> Who the fuck knew? <laughs> yeah, sorry. But uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap us up here. So um, other than that, we got a lot of great stuff on the channel. Um, you know, obviously, we've been talking about Sycophant every chance we get. Check out the trailer. It's on the on the channel there for you to watch. It'll also be in the ending reel here. And uh, yeah, uh, also, we've got a lot of good reviews out. Uh, Luke 
He checked out uh, Till Death Do Us Part, which we got to uh, put out. That just came out on Friday. Like we talked for about 10 minutes at the beginning here, I saw the Meg 2. had a lot to say about it. Um, and we both got to check out a really cool uh, film with our boy Kyle Gallner in it. Speaking of Scream, uh, he had was in one of those for two seconds. And, uh, you know, it, he, he was in a film called The Passenger. We both got to check that out. So all of those reviews are up for your viewing pleasure, as well as Luke got to talk to some Final Destination alum here uh, with the director of Till Death Do Us Part. So you got to sit down. Uh, interview him. Uh, go ahead, plug that for yourself there. Let him know uh, how'd that conversation go for you. Oh, it was really intriguing. Uh, he gave us some tidbits of Till Death to Us part um, and just filmmaking in general. So if you haven't watched it, it's, a, it's about a 14 minute interview in total. So not a huge commitment. And you get a lot of good um, ideas, just what it takes to step behind the camera and, you know, some of the obstacles that uh, you run through that you don't even think about it. But yeah, really great interview with Timothy Woodward Jr. Absolutely. Definitely a lot of fun. And uh, I enjoyed it. So I got to check it out this morning. Um, so I, I like that a lot. And um, yeah, we do got a lot of great stuff on the horizon. Uh, again, we've been just uh, very blessed lately by the movie gods. We got a lot of cool uh, upcoming releases that we got to check out. And we're going to be talking to some people and we're going to be talking about some documentaries and some other horror flicks so keep it right here with us we got lots of good stuff on the horizon as well as last voyage of the demeter next week so we might have a lot to say about that we might have very little so we'll have to just wait and see but uh yeah other than that guys that is going to wrap us up here so until next time i am dylan Newell. and i'm luke janesco and remember stay scared <laughs>